path uh, or making it happen. Um, what does April 15th mean to uh, many of you? Anybody knows April 15th? Tax day. Tax day. For us, uh, it means that we are fully ready uh, for everybody to submit their taxes. We're actually the makers of TurboTax, Mint, and QuickBooks, which is a series of products that are uh, targeted to for self-employed and small businesses. Our audience are consumers, small businesses, and self-employed. To meet our customers, uh, we're actually uh, working on the latest uh, and greatest software. We have 21 locations in nine countries, uh, and you can see the countries here. So we're actually a pretty big company. We're about 8,000 people. Um, we win a lot of awards. We're kind of a humble company, so um, probably many of you didn't hear about us. Maybe you heard about TurboTax. Uh, but what we do is extremely meaningful. And if you look for a software with meaning, uh, we really believe we do that. What we do actually really helps um, companies to get going and customers to be successful. Uh, we win a lot of awards, best place to work at, et cetera. The one I'm most excited about is the Future 50, which is a new list that came out last year. And actually, the company that best positions for growth. The reason it's as exciting is that we are actually a 35-year-old company. In our work, we use, um, like I said, a lot of technology. And we apply it in a innovative ways. Um, and you know, being a small business could be a really lonely endeavor. So uh, we talk about how we use the power of many for the prosperity of one. Now I want to talk about me a little bit and introduce myself. I'm now 25 years into my career. And actually, if you wanted to follow my path, you couldn't. <laughs> Is that a good teaser or what? Um, and you know, but I've learned some important lessons in my early um, career. My very first job was actually in the Israeli military. I actually, you know, in Israel, military is compulsory. So I actually didn't have this big debate or decision to make about around where I'm going to work. Uh, it was kind of decided for me. Um, after I went to the military, I got my shot and a set of really ugly green clothes. Um, I, you know, we're all sitting in the room and I heard that we are now soldiers 24 by 7. Oh yeah, and we didn't get paid. Um, and you know, however, I've learned some of the most important lessons in that job. I was an engineer, and what we worked on, even though again, we, we didn't get paid, what we worked on was extremely meaningful, and we were always felt like we were on a mission. It was very important, very meaningful, and we worked at the t as a team to get it accomplished. More than that, um, one of the things, we always had something missing, so we never had everything that we needed. So we learned to be resourceful. I use these lessons today as well. By the way, this is not where I learned about open source. Then I went to work at what is now termed the most important debt company in Silicon Valley. You probably didn't hear about General Magic either. General Magic was a company that was trying to do basically smartphones well before smartphone existed. It uh, actually was trying to work with technologies such as touch screens and other technologies that we are very familiar with today, but many years ago. Uh, the company eventually didn't make it. It was too far reach of where it wanted to go and where the market is ready. However, the reason is it's, it is termed the most important debt company in, in the Valley is because if you take any smartphone today, you can almost track it back, almost any smartphone back to General Magic. Some of the members of the General Magic team, they went ahead and they joined Apple and they created iPod and iPhone. And actually the founders of Android, Andy Rubin, he was a hardware engineer 
uh, general magic. So that passion these people had for smartphones continued and actually eventually uh, the technology did meet their needs. So uh, while general magic didn't succeed, again, there were actually very amazing lessons in that experience for me as well. The first thing is this innovator mind is really looking at technology as something that is completely life-changing and something that you can apply in amazing ways to do all sorts of crazy things. I've also learned that you can totally over-engineer and that you really fundamentally need to focus on customers. So while you can't follow my path, because one was in the military and another one is a company that's dead now, um, you can actually have great lessons in how you pursue your career. And the most important, th most important thing that I've learned from these early experiences is actually how to work. I continued to Ariba, that actually uh, was at the time the biggest Java apps or, uh, app around, to VMware, where we started to um, revolutionize how infrastructure is done, and um, Docker. Um, and I was at a Docker in a really pivotal time where it really started to take off and we um, created great communities with it. At some point, I became a manager. Oh, by the way, along this line, almost in, in many of these jobs, I actually uh, had a family and one day, um, I can tell you about kind of women in tech and having a family, all of that. But I do want to say that actually one of my sons is here in the audience. <laughs> I tell him I'll embarrass him. He's actually studying computer science here in UIUC. Hi, Ophir. <laughs> is that enough embarrassment? Um, so um, at some point in my career, um, I actually moved into management. It, it actually happened to general magic. And as I started moving into management, I've noticed something. I've noticed that some people were more successful than others, where they were like better engineers. And uh, that was actually quite interesting. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention I'm into it now, but I did talk about that. And that was actually very interesting. And the successful engineers had many of the qualities that you can think about today. You know, people talk about grit and being team players, being smart and hardworking and being oriented toward results. Yeah, it's all there. But I actually noticed there was something else with these people. They always managed to stay relevant. They always brought some new ideas. They had new insight. They always talked about things that are happening from the outside, on the outside, and they brought it back in. I also notice that it's not easy to do that. <coughs> As you get going, you start really focusing on your job and what you're doing, and staying relevant is actually a struggle, especially if you're a manager. Today, here, you're studying the most advanced things, and you really feel like you're on top of things, and you know, you're, you're really studying about the latest and greatest. But really, the industry is doing something like this. The reality is that the changes just keep accelerating. And there is more and more technologies that are coming that weren't there before. And not only that, they come at a pace that is much faster. That, why, that, is why, why I, that is why I believe that relevancy is going to be defining in your careers. Let's look at Intuit. Um, Intuit as a company, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? It's, it's a mime. Who is doing the mics here? Hello? I'm going to out of battery. They tried like bazillion. Why don't you keep going for right now and we'll try to fix Can you guys it. hear me? I'll shout. 
One of the things you learn in leadership that you have to shout. No, I'm kidding. Um, so um, if you look at Intuit and its history, it actually started, OK. Can you hear me now? Whoa. <laughs> I scared myself. Um, OK, so let me put it in and talk at the same time. Apparently, I can't do that. OK. And by the way, I have two mics. I've never been so mic'd before. Um, you clearly are on top of technology. Um, so in fact, companies are struggling with being relevant as well. And if you look at Intuit's 35 history, it started an era of DOS, moved to the era of Windows, moved to the era of web, and now it's uh, an era of mobile and cloud. These are huge shifts. These are like tectonic shifts. And with that, uh, Intuit had to change and reinvent itself again and again. And in fact, if you're an engineer working in any company, you have to reinvent yourself as well because the fact that you know DOS is really not interesting when you start working on the web. By the way, in every turn, competition came uh, by and Intuit managed to uh, stay um, afloat and actually be really successful. I really like the graph that shows the stock price, by the way. It's really cool. So one of the stories that Brad, our CEO, talks about is this where he was on a plane and then there's like article that uh, caught his eyes and that article basically said why isn't Intuit dead um, and he went on to read that and it talks about how Intuit was very successful in disrupting itself again and again. Actually though, that writer is now uh, featuring Intuit often and often is fascinating how Intuit is able to keep performing at the top of its game. So, you know, if we were sitting here 10, 15 years ago, uh, we were probably not being talking about open source. But open source is one of these things that really changed the industry. And this is one of these trends that started very nascent. And before knowing it, it's just something that you have to um, know today. So what I want to do today is, as an example of relevancy, talk about open source, and then at the end, I'll bring it back to relevancy again. Before we do that, I'm actually curious to, about your involvement in this space in open source. So if you can actually go to your devices and uh, quickly answer like a few simple questions. Quickly answer, we'll just wait uh, about a minute and then uh, we'll, we'll check. We should switch. OK, let's take a look at the results. Um, by the way, I love this tool, Slido. I talked about it so much that actually the founders reached out to me to ask me for what are the feature enhancements. So, um, so um, I see that many of you actually never uh, committed to open source. And I think after today, you'll probably feel a bit of an urge to <laughs> maybe do that. Um, and that um, there are some uh, committers, but actually there are um, almost no maintainers uh, here. 
So I, it's kind of what I expected. Um, again, I think open source is, is extremely important. We're going to talk more about that. So um, let's talk a little bit about the open source history. It's an um, amazing uh, story, actually. It started um, from a printer um, at MIT that got jammed, and a person named, um, I'm blanking on the name, of course. Anyway, RMS, which is, um, uh, exactly, Richard Stallman, not good with names. Um, and, and basically, he and his team uh, wanted to put a hack in the printer where it actually will send a note when the printer is jammed to, um, to make sure that people that send something for the printer will go and fix that. Um, and it actually worked until the software, like printer changed, they brought a new printer, and they couldn't do that anymore. And when they asked for the software, they were told, no, 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 you can't access it. It is under NDA. Uh, the software is actually really valuable to us. Um, so Richard actually got upset. And he had this belief that software fundamentally should be free. So he created GNU. And he started this movement of free software. You, I, I, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with GNU. First of all, it started from a Unix version uh, that was free. And then, I don't know how many of you, use, you, of you used Emacs, JCC, JDB, yeah, no? Um, but anyway, a lot of very meaningful tools that the, you know, the industry and academia and in particular was based on. Now, uh, at some point, he actually was not happy about how people use, um, how people use um, the free software, and that some of them were modifying the free software, and they were making proprietary copies of it. Right? They will say modification, they'll start selling it. And he really, really believed, still believes, that software should be free. So he created the GNU public license. And in fact, you know, he basically, as a teaser to copyright, he actually called it copy left. And his idea was if you actually take a project, a GNU project, and you change that, you still wanna, it still has to be free. So everything that you create has to be free as well. That was a really interesting move. It actually played as a double-edged sword because as companies really started to work with free software, et cetera, they actually moved away from uh, GNU and GPL because they wanted to have proprietary software on top. At the same time, around the same um, time, uh, Linus came up with Linux. And his philosophy was, Actually, I want to invite as many people as I can to help and contribute into, uh, into my software and actually make it better. And that caught a lot of momentum. And then there was this guy called Eric Raymond who wrote this, who contributed to both GNU as well as uh, Linux. And he wrote this really um, important essay that I actually recommend you read. That's called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. The example that he gave is that in a cathedral, there's only a few people, like in the GNU model, there's only really a few people that build this really amazing code. While in the Bazaar, Linux, it's available to everybody. And his experience, the Bazaar was actually a better experience because, in fact, he, had, he came up with this Linus law that basically said, and I want to quote the exact word, that given enough eyeballs, all, bag, all bugs are shallow. So actually, by having a lot of people uh, work on your code, it becomes higher quality. In his essay, he actually had many other things that are really fundamental in how we think about software today, including really key elements of DevOps. Um, which is part of release early and release often, a really fascinating um, essay. Um, then something interesting has, ha has happened. 
free software and open source uh, kind of took their way. Uh, Linux was more like an open source where the idea was uh, the source is open, many people can contribute, and that's awesome. Where free software was, was mainly around, no, 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 the software fundamentally has to be free, and that's the important thing. Um, open source really took off as a concept. And then corporations started to jump, to jump in. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it started with VL Linux and Red Hat actually going public, giving a lot of credibility to open source um, projects. And then IBM jumping on the bandwagon as well, and suddenly um, it just became this thing in the industry. However, for many companies, and I worked from one, um, actually with their experience, even this is like a, a span of like many years, what they actually experienced is this a bit of a boiling frog, uh, you know, feeling is that, you know, for many companies there was this belief that there's some software that fundamentally will never be open source. Like who will create infrastructure open source, right? That must be enterprises behind it. And then many companies woke up to have competition that is fundamentally free, open source, available for everybody to take on, to fork, to do whatever they want, and nobody pays for it. This is the list of the top open source project uh, today. This is actually conducted by one of the VCs. Uh, as, you, as you can see, there is open source in every category. And uh, I want to say I had a fortune to work at Docker, which is, I heard it's like number two, number five. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's really one of the top open source project. And I had an, uh, a pleasure to see it grow and to deal with a community of passionate thousands of developers and companies that want to take it to multiple directions. I've learned a ton from it. The, one of my key learning is the, how fundamental open source is in our industry. And that eventually, you know, there many people believe that all software will either be open source or served as a service, like software as a service. And there's probably almost not going to be any um, software that is like enterprise, doing software, packaging it, and selling it. Like I said, the industry kind of jumped on this. Is the battery off again? No. Uh, the industry has kind of jumped on this uh, bandwagon. And today, open source, oh my god, OK. <laughs> today, open source is actually used as a way to test adoption into the market. So many companies that say, I'm going to start with open source. I'm going to test adoption into the market. Uh, I'm going to get some market validation and actually build a strong uh, follows, strong followers and like in users, and then I'm going to monetize. I'm going to find a way to make money. And uh, you know, this, is, by the way, was the Docker philosophy as well. Um, and, and a way to monetize would be to basically give the product for free, but have a, a set of features that you put behind a wall, and then those needs to be paid to provide uh, training and support, to uh, provide professional services, or actually say, I'll host it for you in the cloud, but you're gonna, uh, I'm going to offload complexity, but you're going to pay me for that. And then established companies are jumping on that as well. And there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One, they see open source as a way to get, um, to get customers into their business. So I know we have Google people here, but Kubernetes and Google is an example where Kubernetes is fundamentally the theory is if we invest in that, people are actually going to use Google Cloud. Um, and another reason people invested in that is actually to enhance their brand or, like we talked about, uh, being relevant. At Intuit, by the way, we uh, do the same thing. Uh, we're actually using a ton of open source projects. And we released a few as well. We have a bunch of testing um, software that we 
release. There is a location, device location, open source, and more notably, we actually through an acquisition, we have a, a project called Argo in the continuous development um, area. We actually have a lot of customers that use our open source project. And uh, you know, you can see some of them here. So let's, uh, let's kind of think about the world before open source and the world now. Um, you can very easily today look into how code is implemented, where before if you wanted to learn a particular thing or look at an example of good code, it was hardly available. Today you can go to many projects and, and get inspired by that. Instead of learning by reading or looking for articles, you can easily go and um, online and look at code and look at what's available in GitHub, let's say, and be very hands-on. Instead of collaborating between the four walls of your companies and your, most of the collaboration is there, you actually can collaborate with communities that is very distributed, that has thousands of developers and you can sit who knows where and um, work on open source from there. Open source is like building blocks, it's like Lego. Uh, you can very easily get going. In fact, today, even like at Intuit or any company, when you actually work on a new feature, one of the first things you do is basically say, let me look online what open source project is available. That would be my starting point. So you can easily build, build your software from open source components, where before you would have to purchase software to get going. And while before much of your architecture inside uh, companies would be corporate architecture with decisions of what software to bring in, it's very democratized today. Many engineers will just bring their own technology. And the more you know about this, the more you can bring into your company and their technology as well. Um, it actually helps you build your resume. I can tell you for sure, like a Docker where we uh, you know, we would hire people, but basically picking them from the community. We we'll look online, and even today, I will look online who's contributing, and we we'll like make contact and say, "Hey, do you want to work here?" And even today at Intuit, we will often look at uh, your contribution in open source. So it's just a way. It's not like it's not a must, but it's actually a great way to uh, enhance your uh, resume if, if you want. In fact, you don't even need to have a degree or uh, you know, be in an internship. You can do your own internship. You can basically go online and start contributing to a bunch of open source and build a whole portfolio uh, without even working for a company. Of course, nobody will pay you, but that's a whole different thing. Um, we actually had this summer a couple of high schoolers that as a summer project they worked and they contributed to Kubernetes uh, as an example. But that was an example where, again, you don't even have to have a degree. Um, you, know, you just like, you can just get going. So it's a great way to augment your resume. So like this is exactly what co companies do. They go online and they look and say, oh, like this, like for example, this is a really great, would you hire this person? Yeah, I, I would. Uh, this is Linus's GitHub profile. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we talked about open source and how um, today is not really part of the industry, but is really part of how you should think about um, your career. But it wasn't always the case that open source was that important. In fact, when I went to school, nobody talked about it. We did use GNU stuff, but nobody talked about open source as a thing. Um, and in fact, probably if we were sitting here 10, 15 years ago, we would not be talking about it either. So the question is, beyond open source, what else is, is out there that you should know? And uh, you know, I pulled uh, this, this uh, list of like the, from Gartner, of the top 10 strategic technology trends. And you know, you can see a lot of recognized things here. I mean, they all sound so, so beautiful. 
Uh, but you know, like you see AI, uh, you see Internet of Things, conversational platform, etc. We use many of these at Intuit as well, by the way. Um, and but if you look forward 10 years, this list is going to be very different. Um, so we are likely to be able to predict now what's going to be on that list. So I don't know about you, but uh, your head can kind of explode from this like change constantly. Um, so I think often about this because I often think about how do I keep myself relevant and uh, you know, that's my teaser for you is like, how do you keep yourself uh, relevant without your head is exploding? And, you know, I did um, put down a few ideas. These are kind of simple, but I also think they're kind of fundamental. So um, let me go through, through them. In essence, I would divide the how to keep yourself relevant into two parts. The first one is how do you discover what is interesting? And the other part is how do you participate? On the discover side, again, just a few, there's no like theory here, but just like a few tips of things that I found useful. The first thing is starts from being always curious. So if you think that you leave school and then your learning is done, uh, I would change that assumption. Your learning actually continues. And you know, the good news is you're not gonna have midterms and all this stuff. But you know, companies do have reviews, and for some reason people always like to rate people. Um, it's really easy to be absorbed in your job. And one thing I would urge you is make sure you have time to, uh, to, to learn. I, even though I have a huge job, um, I spend time, allocate time to go and do learning. So where do you learn from? A great way to learn, a great way to learn is from like books, podcasts, blogs, and you know, the internet. I assembled a few things here that I really like. If you haven't, if you want to be an entrepreneur, Highly encourage you listen to Master of Scales. Um, Hacker News is this unbelievable resource of understanding what is important for developers today. And there's a variety of books that are just gonna uh, inform you on a, on, a, on a variety of topics. Don't restrict yourself just to learn about technology per se. You may wanna learn about methodology, et cetera. I mean, again, Agile was invented as, as a way to really change how people do software, and that came up from, um, from discovery as well. The third thing is that invest in your network. In fact, if there is anything, I know that my talk is titled Open Source Open Mind, but if there's anything you want to remember from my talk is this. This is probably the most important thing that I found is uh, network and talk to people and um, just like a way to uh, uh, get and transfer information that is unbelievable, really, really will be important in, in your career. So I recommend you really invest in that. Don't think of your network as like, oh, I have all these people that I just can't wait to see how I use. Think about them as, um, as you know, a way to, that, uh, like basically you invest in your network. I always, make it a habit to give more to my network than what I take. I really, really invest in my network. I really believe in that. And you know, it has been really meaningful for me. In fact, all my jobs I found through a network. Um, and the, where you are today, one of the top schools, is gonna be a great place for you to network. In fact, uh, you know, again, one of the top schools, I'm sure many of you, many, some of you are gonna go be founders, super successful founders. Uh, maybe some of you are going to be uh, leaders, maybe some of you are going to be CTOs, maybe even CEOs. And for the rest of you, it's always good to know a CEO, right? So, you know, you may want to make friends now. The other great place, the other place, great place to learn is actually conferences. I found conferences 
as an amazing place to learn, and I make a point to go to conferences today. In fact, one of my favorite places in conferences is the Expo Hall. In those sessions, you learn a lot from sessions, but actually go and talk to companies and talk to people. Um, AWS reInvent, which is basically the AWS cloud conference, it's just like a zoo, it's like this big conference. But there's like hundreds of companies in the exhibit floor, and I actually methodically probably go and meet like at least a quarter of them. And what are you working on? What are you using? So like I just find it super, super helpful, and I find a lot of things um, there. There's a bunch of conferences that are, that are super interesting. This is a partial list. And the last thing I want to say here is like, don't limit yourself to this domain. In fact, if you just stay in the technology domain, you end up eventually being in some sort of an echo chamber. Everybody just talk about the same thing, et cetera. So get out of your comfort zone and do some link learning um, so you can actually look at some other areas. In fact, in my staff meeting every week, we start from a round table where everybody talks about what I've learned this week. And the topics range from all sorts of things, things that people saw in the company, uh, people that, uh, things that people saw outside. I remember somebody was once talking about like some farming experience they had. Um, bottom line, it's always valuable to learn, even if it's not seems like immediately connected. Once you discover something, just do something about it. So start pulling a thread. If you uh, heard about something interesting, go later on and, and research. I constantly make a list of things to go and Google afterwards or read about afterwards. In fact, just in this visit here, I wrote a bunch of things on a piece of paper. Um, so I'm going to go and research later on. Um, and then don't just run around with solutions looking for problems. You know, uh, at Intuit we say fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And we have this methodology that we call design for delight, uh, in which you understand a problem so deeply that eventually you go so uncomfort uncomfortably narrow to get to a solution. But it's too often that I hear people, they run around, they say, oh, blockchain, you know, AI. I mean, I totally agree these are very, very relevant technologies today, but they're not always applicable. So don't just run around with buzzwords. Um, that, that's not the way to do it. Quickly get to be hands-on and put your hands on the code. We talked about open source and how easy it is to contribute, look at open source or whatever. So just very quickly, get online, be hands-on, don't just theorize about it, do something. And today is really, really easy to um, get going. There's really no barrier to entry. When you think about it, I mean, today you can actually get the power of this unbelievable compute and machines in your hands um, in the cloud. You can actually start a company while you hear, not I'm saying that you should do that, but you know, you can actually start a company from your dorms if you want it, right? It's so easy. You don't need to create a data center. You don't need to go and buy machines. You, you can just get going. There's all these, like, especially for students, there are all these ways. And last is um, not everything that you learn actually applies right away, but learning is always useful. And sometimes you just store it for later and you reuse, you reuse it, and sometimes you just throw it away. In fact, most of the code that people write is thrown away, and there's always new code. So get ready to basically write a lot of code and throw it away. Don't get too in love with your, with your code, but the learning do stay forever. So anyway, we talked about how things are constantly evolving and changing, and how important it is to remain relevant. We used open source as an example, as something that is prevalent today, but actually wasn't here that, not that long ago. And we discussed how you can um, use methodologies to continue staying relevant. And guess what I wish you all is a fun industry surfing. So anyway, that's it. 
we're actually going to go to some uh, Q&A now. Yes. So uh, let's say there's a very, very new trend out there. How do you tell the difference, like how do you tell whether this trend is actually going to go off and be a big thing or whether it's just going to kind of fizzle out? Like maybe let's say Node.js when it was, back when it was IOJS or something like that. How do you tell that difference? Um, sometimes you don't and you, you know, like, by the way, uh, there is a chart that I didn't see here, but there's a chart that shows technology. Oh, repeat the question. How do you know whether something is a real trend or just something that is there, like a blip that is going to go away? And uh, you know what I'm saying is actually sometimes you don't. And uh, when something is, is um, it, it, so the, there's a, a graph that shows how technology trends, they follow a curve. Where at the beginning, there's kind of this, this like nobody knows about it. And then there's like this false excitement, you know, like there's over, like this feeling of over promise and over excitement of, of, of a topic and then it kind of stabilizes and, um, and you know, some people, some technologies completely exit, like they go away and then, then some of them they're just stabilized and you know, there's this kind of a curve that show that and uh, many technologies they go through like, you know, over hype, super everybody excited and then, then they stabilize and some like completely drop and you don't know. And that's why you know, it's important to really see if something is applicable to you and also be ready to throw away because the number of, w of times you're gonna have to implement something is, is actually pretty astonishing. I can tell you, for example, that Intuit, uh, we and like DevOps is a place, uh, where space I come from, just changed so many times over the last several years that uh, is, is kind of unbelievable. And the number of times that Intuit we, we wrote a pipeline that we threw away and we rewrote it again is actually quite astonishing. We, we're writing one, I was just talking uh, today, we, we're writing now one with Kubernetes, but you know, I'm already thinking, oh, what if in the world of functions and serverless and how is this gonna look like, right? So uh, I know this is time limited, all, all of these things. So you don't know, but you try and you, you kind of work through them. Other questions? Yes? In the back. Uh, what would you say the easiest way any person in this room could get started like right now uh, on open uh, That's actually a really good um, point. So in open source, for first of all, take an area of passion for you. If it's like DevOps or infrastructures, a bunch of projects. If it's um, you know apps, there's a bunch of other projects. So pick an area of passion for you. And then many of these projects, especially the big ones, and I know we definitely had a Docker, they will actually tag issues as easy or like get started issues. So you should pick those ones and really start from like, don't take kind of, oh, like there's like an issue here of like re-implement, you know, the, the guts of the system. I mean, that's not a good one to start from. Um, but I told you about like a, a couple of high schooler that contributed to Kubernetes, they had very, they started from a very minor UI change that uh, from that, like the Kubernetes um, workflow needed, and then they worked their way up. And many of these projects, go and browse, GitHub is phenomenal, I'm sure all of you have GitHub accounts, just go and browse there. Many of these projects will actually walk you through contributions and they tag their issues as easy and start from those and you build yourself over time. Yes, in the back. Uh, I'm not sure I've heard it correctly, but you're saying that many of the companies are um, making money out of doing extensions uh, on top of open source. And I think your question was that actually not in line with the spirit of open source? Um, so and <coughs> yes and no. And again, at Docker, we would have this debate like an existential debate on a, on a daily basis. What should be part of the open source and what should not? 
So here, here's my answer. And this is, the, by the way, the fundament, some of the fundamental changes, uh, some, some of the fundamental change in thought between free software and open source is this, is software fundamentally should be free. It's like uh, free software is like free speech. Like it just should be there, right? Um, you're right, but I would say that the fact that people can monetize open source today actually attracts many companies to work on open source. So as a result, we have a much richer open source community and open source projects because people say, oh, I better invest companies, invest VCs, fund. Now, if it was just kind of like you wouldn't be able to monetize it, you know, again, it's like market. There is the supply, there's demand, right? There's demand or supply. So it's, you know, I would say, yes, you're right in a philosophical uh, um, Plain, I would say you're absolutely right. However, on a day-to-day, -day, because people are able to monetize, that's why we have the richness of open source. Yeah, actually, yeah, on the back. So you mentioned earlier in your presentation that you fall in love with a problem. Um, how do you solidify that problem so that you can create those communities to create solutions for the problems? Um, how do you sell the problem for like open source communities or in general? In general, I mean, just assuming that there are, there is a problem that needs to be fixed, you need a community to fix that problem. Or you need to convince the community that there is a problem. Uh, right, if you wanna use, um, you know, again, open source, um, you will wanna create community. And actually community creation is, is another topic I'm, uh, really uh, passionate about because it's, it's actually a whole interesting thing of how you create community, how you have a following. But you know, the concept of falling in love with the problem, not the solution, is, is a bit uh, more generic. Is that when you think about a product, or open source or whatever, it's good when, you th when you're basically saying, I wanna solve that problem, as opposed to I have a hammer and I'm gonna look for a nail, right? So. Um, it's better to, to like, if you look at like Airbnb, uh, you know, it started from people that were looking for a place to stay and then they, they kind of uh, went and did that. Like, you know, like almost any company, like Facebook, right? It starts from a, like somebody had a problem and they looked at a way to solve it and then they, um, you know, then they actually created a very successful, um, you know, company out of that. And often at the beginning you have to, define the problem very, very narrowly. Because if you start to be all things to all people, it doesn't really work. Um, and you know, but again, like that, that's how many companies started. And you've, if you research history of super successful companies, that's how they got going. It's very rarely that you have, uh, you know, companies that started from, oh, I have an AI, where do I apply it, right? Or I have this thing, where do I apply it? Blockchain, where do I apply it? Sometimes they do, but often is when it's like applicable to like a particular problem, not just kind of, you run around with a solution. Yes? So one of the big benefits of open source projects like Docker or Kubernetes is the lack of a vendor lock-in. You get a lot of flexibility. So as a decision maker, how do you decide when like, a, a third-party add-on or API is worth like, you know, the, getting yourself locked into a particular solution for? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, so the question was uh, projects like Docker and, and Kubernetes, they offering kind of uh, vendor free um, um, environment. So when you actually decide on connecting with a particular vendor, how do you decide that? Is that, did I? Yeah, how, how do you decide like, you know, when it's worth the lock-in, basically? What's yeah. Um, so, you know, if you, don't need to be locked in. If you basically can use open source as is, and you don't, um, uh, you can go without a lock-in, then I would say, um, you know, like that, that should be your default. And in many companies, this, this is like, again, what I'm seeing is many companies, this is, what I'm, there was, this is what I was trying to explain, like open source kind of happened to companies, and I think today, many companies don't even understand the importance of that. They don't understand that they need to have a community of people inside their companies that constantly contributing to open source, they constantly um, 
uh, you know, maybe develop open source project, but they're open source fluent. And in that situation, you might be very intimidating to contribute to uh, you know, another software, and you need somebody to do that for you, right? So in those cases, you need a vendor. Um, so if you basically, let me kind of try to answer in simplicity, it's like if you can do it without a vendor, in my eyes, you should. But sometimes you just don't have the expertise, you personally or as a company, and then you still need to like somebody to stand behind it, be able to fix uh, issues, be able to announce, and that's what kind of uh, vendors are providing you on top of that. But you know, my, my philosophy, if you can use open source plane, if you have enough expertise, just go do that. I think we'll maybe take one more. One more question. We're good to go. Sorry if I scared people off. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking about how to end the talk. And I thought uh, the office is always relevant. What do you think? Um, so um, anyways, before I uh, go, there, we do have a couple of people here from Intuit. We have Sandeep, who actually got his PhD from UIUC, so he's very familiar with that. And we have uh, Charles there on the, uh, where's Charles? Oh, here, sorry, Charles there on the back. I was like, ah, I thought you were there. Um, and uh, he's from our recruiting team, so if you want to talk to them or me, you're, you're welcome. Thank you so much for coming out here to speak with us. Uh, we just like to present you with a little thank oh, you card. Thank you. Wow. It's, it's engraved. Special. Yeah. Um, we've been trying to bring industry and academia together for years. This year is our 24th year of RP, and you've helped make that um, legacy carry on. So we also made a little speaker bag for you. Oh, thank and you so much. As a little fun thing, we added a cute little squirrel wow. with an Illini eye. <laughs> but yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much for having me here and showing me the wonderful weather of Illinois. So guys, there's dinner outside. Uh, a couple of speakers, actually all our speakers I believe who are in town are going to like 